Thank you so much, Laura and Kenley and Maddie, uh, for that. That was great. Uh, welcome this morning. Everybody doing okay, I hope. Uh, it's going to be a good day in the Lord, of course. Uh, we'll listen to the Word be preached. Uh, we'll sing songs. Uh, but uh, for those in here that made a profession of faith, we'll be able to uh, take part into the Lord's Supper, remembering uh, what He did uh, for us. So I'm uh, looking forward to a good morning. Uh, on the back of your bulletin, it has the fall schedule. Just, uh, of course, I mentioned the Lord's Supper. A uh, couple things to look at. September 4th, Sunday School Promotion. Uh, and then uh, Saturday, September the 10th, uh, there's going to be a meeting for an Operation Christmas Child project leader. This would be someone that pretty much, uh, a project leader is someone that inside the church, a part of the church that promotes uh, and makes sure that everything as far as getting the boxes together, uh, getting the stuff in, getting them um, just ready to ship out, we really need somebody for that area. So if you're willing to do that, if you'll just contact the church office, if you would like to be uh, a part of helping in that capacity. Uh, we have a bridal shower coming up. You can see that there as well as uh, a baby shower. And then women, don't forget um, the women's retreats coming up and sign up for that. So this morning I'm going to read out of Luke chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 13, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have no, nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you so much for your body uh, being broken and your blood being spilt. And as we worship you today, may you be glorified in everything that's done here. And may we be edified. And as we leave this place, may we continue to uh, be the salt and the light uh, to the, our community, but also the world around us. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
Nothing good that I have done, no praise of mine could be enough. All my striving ends in vain, my righteousness found in your name.
seated. Take out your Bibles and turn to James chapter 4 as we continue our study in James. We do look forward to celebrating the Lord's table, uh, the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, which all baptized believers uh, will be welcome uh, to take part in. But before we get there, uh, we are going to look at a subject or look at an issue that may very well be the most challenging for professing believers. Maybe the one issue that we can become so susceptible to, if we're not careful, if we do not keep our guard up, if we not, do not pay attention to our daily walk with the Lord. Uh, Brad and I were talking the other day, and he reminded me of a remark by a student, not, well, not one of our students, but a, a, a remark that was made in a video series that the youth has gone through. It's called Road Trip to Truth. It's a wonderful video series. If you'd be interested in uh, taking it, uh, we have copies of it and, and looking at it, listening to it, watching it. it. It's a series that speaks to all of the different um, arguments and criticisms that people have of the Christian faith, in particular, particularly in regards to the current uh, cultural situation we find ourselves in our youth and this uh, postmodern, as we would call it, as a culture that we live in where there's no absolute truth, everything's relative and those sorts of things. But he reminded me of a remark made by a young lady, and the remark that she made was, I am a Christian, but not a practicing Christian. Now, it was a very matter-of-fact and intellectual-sounding comment that she made, like it was just another choice that someone makes as they're living their life. And I, I really want to be very careful here because... Uh, she may very well be a genuine believer, and I'll leave that to, to the righteous judge to determine, but I, I, I can perhaps assume that maybe she had just not been taught better, but to speak to the statement that was made itself, uh, to the biblical accuracy of the statement itself, um, I'm not sure if there is a clearer statement of ignorance concerning the Christian life than that statement. Now, she may very well have just not been taught better uh, and may not have articulated, articulated it well. Maybe she was trying to say that I'm simply out of God's will. I'm not living the life that I should. But it is not a statement that would hand, uh, stand up to any kind of biblical scrutiny. And, and I'd be willing to say that there, there are people sitting here, and it's one of the reasons, you know, I've said before, there's really so many truths, so many things that you can preach on. We just preach on them in a lot of different ways, but there's a, there's a certain amount of truths, and we go over them over and over so that uh, they become part of who we are. They become ingrained in our heart, but there are, many, there are some sitting here today, I would imagine, that could not really articulate their belief, their faith, to someone else, whether it may be challenging, it may be a, a sense of uh, uh, inability and those kinds of things, but, but that's okay as long as we're continuing to make growth 
in that. As long as we're continuing to build up uh, our understanding of it and practice sharing it. But what she had done is uh, make a statement of belief in a set of doctrines, but there's no change in her life. There's no application in her life. There's there's no attachment to her life. And if you remember before, we said and uh, we read and talked about in chapter 2, verse 19, that you say that God is one, you do well, but the demons believe and yet they tremble. The biggest problem with the statement that was made is what you might call it a demonic faith, but was not even confident enough in it to tremble at it. It's just, uh, it's just sort of a, an intellectual kind of idea that's out there and people will claim Christianity for a whole variety of reasons. But there's only one that really matters. She's a practicing Christian. The fact is, either you are a Christian or you are not. There is no hybrid in there anywhere. Either you are saved or you are lost. And the mistake, the one of the mistakes is being made is that... Uh, the, the, the statement assumes that it's a question of what we do rather than who we are. And the reality is who we are determines what we do. If we are a believer being changed and transformed by the Lord, then we walk in that light and we walk as one being changed and transformed. If we're someone who just has an intellectual belief, trying to work for it, that's nowhere found in, in Scripture. Now, we can certainly be outside God's will as believers. Don't get me wrong. Uh, there's not a perfect one among us. And, and we all stand before the Lord in constant need of grace. But with a, a believer, one out of God's will, there would, become, convi- there would come conviction. The statement itself could be a definition of what our subject or of what I titled the sermon today as we're going to be looking at James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, it could be a definition of practical atheism. And this is, when I started, I I said, I believe that this is one of the most insidious, one of the ones that sneaks up on us before we know it. This is one of uh, the most dangerous things that can creep into the life of a believer as far as doing and living as God would have us to, as those who have been uh, blood-bought, uh, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This idea of practical atheism, that is, I say I believe in God, but I live as if he does not exist. The everyday behavior, the everyday flow of my life as living as though God does not exist. Practically or in practice, well, I say one thing, but in practice, what I do reveals another. So practical Atheism. It's a sad reality in far too many professing believers' lives. Genuine believers who have found themselves caught in this, this, this life of just living it as though I'm out on my own and God has nowhere and no place in it. And we're consider these things and, and as a conclusion to it, before we get to the Lord's Supper, I'll speak briefly on sort of the other side of this. Well, as we live according to God's will, in light of God's presence, in light of His grace, when things don't turn out the way that I want them to. Living out God's will in my life. So if you have James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, would you stand to honor His word, and we'll get into our study this morning. James 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Heavenly Father, we are never outside of your gaze. Lord, we are never outside of your presence. Lord, we can go to the highest heavens or or the deepest pit of hell and still you are there. 
Father, help us to live in light of that truth. Help us to acknowledge you in everything we do. Help us to keep it in the forefront of our hearts and minds that you are not just a God that is far off, but you have come near. You take interest in our lives. You have a plan and purpose for our lives. You are active and a part of and directing our lives. Lord, help us to live in light of the fact that you are the King of kings. You are Lord of lords. You are our creator, our sustainer, our equipper. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you empower us to do all that you've called us to. Lord, help us live as God fears. And God lovers. And not as godless, practical atheists. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So one of the first things we see right out of the gate is the delusion of presumption. What do I mean by that? I I, I presume on things as if they are going to happen. I presume in a way that... Uh, makes me feel like I am in control, and that is a deluded way of thinking. Uh, It is a fanciful way of thinking. It is completely contrary to truth. Uh, Come now, you who say. It's an interjection. That is, it's preceding an argument. And he wants you to remember important facts, important facts about a a, a certain thing that's been said. And, And he says, come now. You who say. He's speaking to a particular audience. And you remember, uh, that you may have heard this in several different cases, if you uh, had classes in school that touched on it, you know, whenever you're telling a story or whenever you are recounting an event, there's certain questions that you must ask, the who, what, when, where, why, and then how, to relate that story. Well, well, well James speaks to every bit of that here in this first sentence, except for the, the how part necessarily, but he He identifies the party. Who's he talking about? There are certain people in the church uh, to which he is writing. And so he says, uh, come now, uh, you who say, uh, the we, we will go. Who's he talking about? The people who are just living a life. They're making plans. And look, there is nothing that is wrong in and of itself with anything that he said here so far. We, group of people are going to do what? They're going to go and trade. They're going to start a business. When are they going to do it? Today or tomorrow? I don't know. It depends on how I feel. Uh, If we get everything together. And then when we get there, we're going to spend a year there. Where? Such and such a town. Uh, We'll figure it out when the time comes. Got this plan. Got this business idea. Think it's going to work and why we're going to make a profit. The only thing he left out really was how. And there's not a single thing wrong with that in and of itself. But they are presuming on everything going as planned. You realize that it's it's actually a blessing that we don't know everything that's going to happen. We would not have the strength or the energy today to pay that rent tomorrow that emotional rent, that emotional cost that comes with knowing what what would come with knowing what is going to happen in the future. If you could sit, I mean, just think of the day you got out of high school. Now, for those of you, you got to look forward a little bit. But the day you got, if you knew everything that was going to happen to your life up until now, you'd be paralyzed by it. Couldn't be able to handle it. By the way, these people are living life and planning on life as if God were nowhere in the picture. This isn't in the text, but it's a 
certainly a biblical corollary to it. I just, by the way, I want you to know, anxiety and worry is the opposite of what we're talking about here. These arrogant, confident plans. But anxiety and worry is just as sinful. Why? Because anxiety and worry sees a future that is void of God as well. Anxiety and worry is living, is living a life in the now as if there is no God upon whom I can rely. As if there is no God upon whom I can rest. As if there is no God who is going to carry my troubles. So it is, it is one of the great sins that, that Christians face, and we don't even actively do it. It's one of those things that can creep up in our lives, but we live life in the here and now, and we view a future that is there and then that is void of God in our lives. Practical Atheism, presuming on a future without God. Anxiety and worry or arrogant confidence or confident arrogance. It's living life as if there is no God. In verse 14 he says, yet you do not know. He's going to bring these people back to reality. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. And you think of the who, what, when, where, and why. They, they have absolutely no control over any of their, those factors. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. There may be someone in the we that is no longer there. Uh, the road to the place where you're planning on going may be, may be destroyed. There's no way to get there. When you get there, you don't even know if you'll be able to set up business let alone spend a year, and you certainly don't know if you're going to make a profit or not. It's just a presumption that things are going to go the way I plan. Now, look, just reality teaches us, you know, in the military, we used to say that a plan is merely something from which to deviate. Because you know, as soon as, as, soon as the battle starts, as soon as the fray begins, uh, the plan is, is gone, and you've got to make adjustments to it. But there is a presumption as if everything rests in their control. And they have absolutely no control over anything. Life is like a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. The King James says vapor. I like that word vapor. There's no specific type that he speaks of here. It could be your breath uh, in, on a cold day. I like to think of, you know, you wake up early in the morning and you look across the field and there's this thin layer of, of vapor, this mist over the, over the fields or over the lawn. Uh, I might like that because of my microclimatology class in, in uh, college. I was a meteorology guy, not a meteorology major. Georgia didn't have that, but uh, I, was, I, I concentrated on meteorology and climatology and I had this uh, microclimatology class. It sounded easy enough. It was an upper level class, but I figured, you know, uh, I actually had a professor whose name was Vern Metermeyer. He was actually fairly well known. He was called Dr. Rot because his particular course, his particular specialty uh, was, was the science of how things decompose, like uh, making compost and those things. Well, the class itself was about the climate within the first few molecules of atmosphere over the surface of a leaf. That's about all I remember of the entire class. I know it was full of physics. I know that it was incredibly hard. It was like, this isn't, I, mean, I, I didn't sign up to be a physics major. It was very difficult. But, but the mist, it relies on a whole lot of different factors, not the least of which is temperature, humidity, and even wind. The wind can come along and, and take that mist up off the top of the lawn. There's all kinds of things that, that just, and even in the normal course of things, in the early morning it's there, but as the sun rises, as it heats up, the relative humidity changes. Maybe I remembered a little bit more than I thought, but, but it, it, just, it just goes away. It disappears. It vanishes. And even in the course of a single day, the mist is nothing. Now think about your breath on a cold day. It's there, and then it's gone. It's gone. That's our lives. 
This is not morbid, though. Please hear me on this. This is, this is not a morbid subject. The fact that we will all face death, it is good to know, the Bible says, that our days are numbered. It's good to know. Psalm 39, 4 says, O Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. It is good to know that there is an end because if you live life as if there is not, you will go and do things on your own for your own pleasures in your own way and you will utterly forget that there is something beyond the grave. You'll utterly forget about an eternity that awaits. It is so interesting how we live in the here and now. We don't live in yesterday. We cannot live in tomorrow. We live in the here and now. And the only thing that we have any remote, uh, remotely any control over is the moment. And what am I doing in the moment? And I live in the moment, not for the moment, not in some ridiculous hedonistic way that says eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you may die. There's really no consequence to life, so just take in all you can. But we live in the moment for eternity in the realization that I have one life to live for God on this side of the grave. And it is a short time. And there are eternal consequences. There are eternal questions that are answered on this side of the grave. And knowing that my days are numbered will keep the young man from doing and the young woman many foolish things. It will give the old men and women a heart of wisdom that, that time is fleeting and passing by. And boy, can I tell you, time is fleeting and passing by. If you have any of the, 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 the tint in your hair that uh, is taken over mine, then you know how fast time goes by. I can remember, if you're in high school, you're in, I can remember sitting in school and thinking, I'm never going to graduate high school. And now it's so far gone, I can barely remember it. Thinking when we first moved here to Columbus, I got four years to Air Force Retirement, i got four years left. On one day, and then the next day, I go, man, I've only got four years left. And now it's a distant memory. Fifteen years ago, you know, there's a day that's coming that we all think of every now and then. And we may think it's far off, and in the natural course of things, it may be far off. But in God's providence, and in God's wisdom, it may be closer now than we think. But there is that time when it comes when we're going to take our last breath. And it may seem so far off. But when that moment comes, we will realize that it's come in just a moment of time. It's not morbid to think about this. For the believer, it gives us a heart of wisdom to redeem the time that we have. To live in complete and utter reliance upon the Lord. To realize that, that I have a moment in time for God to be glorified in my life, which is our ultimate end, which is our ultimate goal. But if we're not careful in the hurry, uh, work a day, rush, rush of life, we will begin to live life as if God does not exist. I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching with you. You know the mirror that is always up in front of me here. We can get so caught up in even the good things that we forget that it is all for a purpose, for the glory of God. And these people have no clue if their plan will come to pass. The second part, verse 15. First of all, there's the delusion of presumption. In verse 15, we see submission to providence. Instead, you ought to say, verse 15, instead you ought to say, here's the error of their ways, and James is going to tell them the right way to live, what you ought to do. In contrast to what you're doing, this is how you should live your life. As it is, they were living as the people of Noah's day. You know what Jesus said about the people of Noah's day in Luke 17, 27? They were marrying and being given in marriage. 
Now, it was depraved before the flood, no question. Every thought of their heart was continual, constantly. And, and there's a very good reason for that, regardless of the exterior expression of depravity. When you begin to live life outside of the knowledge of God or rejecting the knowledge of God, that is as depraved as it gets. You are void of any, any godly influence on your life. Void of it. They're truly... Great sin was living as if God did not exist. And the way, the depravity that went on, we can only imagine. But in other words, they were godless. They were practical atheists. Now, some may have had a hint or an indication or an acknowledgement of God in the least and small way, not in the way that Noah did, not in any way of belief or actual faith. But they were claiming belief in God, but living as if he doesn't exist, perhaps. But this is how it manifests itself today in many Christians' lives. It comes dressed up in many ways, and it is perhaps, as we said, the most sinister, it's the most evil, the most insidious. It it creeps on us before we even know it. It's a challenge to us. So easy to lose touch, forget in our busy lives. It's kind of like a man living as a practical bachelor let me explain that you have a man who is married and in that marriage in that relationship you spend time you keep in touch you share plans you consult one another and a practical bachelor just lives life for himself we 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 throw the term around here you know when 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 robin leaves the house go visit her mom or something like I say I'm a class B bachelor. I'm not a real bachelor, but my wife is not in the home. And generally what I mean by that is got to fend for myself. I'm going to be hungry, try to get people to have pity on me, that sort of stuff. But I'm a class B bachelor. It's, it's kind of like living without a wife, although there's a lot of other things that come into play, fidelity and everything like that. But we're, we're just merely talking about the practical nature of the relationship. But a man who is married but does not keep in contact with his wife, does not consult his wife, does not share dreams, does not fellowship with his wife, living life as a bachelor. And that's what, see, we're not talking about outright depravity. We're not talking about out in this sense. We're not talking about a complete expression of sinfulness. We're just talking about godliness. I am leaving my relationship with God on the shelf I spend no time in his word. I spend no time praying. I spend no time acknowledging him in my life. I go from day to day to day to day and sometimes week to week to week without any acknowledgement or any fellowship with God. I am living as a practical atheist. There's no relationship there. And James is warning against that. And he says... Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will, first of all, live. To do anything else has one requirement. On this side of the grave, you must live. God holds life and death in His hand. Days that are numbered. And let me say a statement here, and I'll let you throw spears at me, and then we'll Explain what I mean. God is not first in your life. God should not be first in your life. I see some sour faces out there. I know what it means. We all say it. But truly, when you get down to it, God is not first. God is all. In other words, and here is part of the danger in that. Now, I'll say it again. I'll say God is not first from time to time. Don't... But but hear me here. If I'm not careful, when I put God first in my life, I'll check the box that has God first. Then I'm, I'm, I'm through with it until the next time it comes around. Example. God's first in my life. I went to church on Sunday. Check. Don't have to worry about it again until next Sunday rolls around. It's not that God is first and I check the list, and now I just move on with my life on the next thing. It's just like saying, uh, uh, my wife is first. I said hello to her in the morning. We had breakfast together. We fellowship. Now I leave. Okay, check that box. No. 
It's a series of lenses through which we see life. And God is all. In other words, for the believer, every single aspect of my life, every single event in my life, every single circumstance I have in my life, every trial, every victory, Whatever happens in my life, it's like I've got a, a 360 degree shield around my head, my head that is tinted with the color of God so that everything I see, I see through the lens of God. I see life that way. My relationship with God impacts every area of my life. There's not one area of my life that I live that is outside of his purview, that is outside of his interest, outside his control. Does that make sense? It's like seeing life through the lens. We, we, we call it in many ways a biblical worldview, which is I see life through the lens of Scripture, but I see life with God at the core. He's not on the list. He is the list. He's the medium upon which I write, he's the, and he's the pen that I use to write. He, he's everything. He's all. If I'm married, my relationship with my wife colors everything else that goes on in my life. It cannot help but, and so on, and so on, and so forth. God is all, and I see all of life relative to, to him, that's what James is getting at. If the Lord wills, if it's in His plan, I yield myself to His plan. I yield myself to His will. I should live in constant awareness of His constant presence. I should live in constant awareness of His will and His way. I should live in constant dependence upon Him. Always and in every case and in every circumstance, the good and the bad. And I want to say especially the bad, but that would be wrong. But, but when it's the easiest to move away from him, that's when I need to draw closest to him. We go to Psalm 37, 4, which has just become, a, it may be my life verse now, I don't know. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in the Lord. To take joy in your relationship with Him. To take joy in your fellowship with Him. To enjoy reading your Bible and having it wash over you and cleanse you. To enjoy being in His presence. Verses 16 and 17, there's the sinfulness of pride. You know, we may find that we have a demonic outlook on things, even as believers. My way, my way, my way. Isaiah 14 says of Satan, of Lucifer, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. The pride that was in his heart. He didn't even say, he didn't even say I'd be, make myself more than God. He said, I will simply make myself like God. I will make myself equal with God. And Satan found himself cast out of heaven because of pride. The same trick he used with Adam and Eve and was successful. For God knows that when you, eat of the, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When we live our lives outside of the purview of God, outside of the authority of God, when we choose to live our life in our own way, we have become guilty of the very thing that Satan was guilty of way back then before sin ever even entered into the earth. I will, I will, I will. And in verse 17, he says, And so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And isn't that something that almost seems like an appendage? It almost seems like an extra thing dangling there at the end of that passage. It's like, wait a minute, you've been talking about this pride, you've been talking about this stuff. Well, the so connects it directly to the previous part of this passage. And James has said the right thing to do. Here's what you ought to do. 
And so for anyone who doesn't do what he knows to be right, it is sin. It's kind of like worship. It is my contention, and it has been, that if we get this right, as a body of believers, true worship, when we gather together as a body and worship the Lord together, the rest of the ministries and the rest of the programs, everything else will fall into place. Everything else will be right because we've paid attention to the main thing. We put the first things first. But you can do all kinds of things for God, and if worship is not right, you're missing out on the blessing of God. I guess root, I guess the root of all sin is pride, and it's on full display here, denying God or living like it, making myself equal with him. James says that ought not be so, but you ought to do this. So just a quick word, because there's a corollary to this. If we are to live according to God's will for our lives, we must accept that with the good and the bad. As Miss Anita makes her way up here. While there's an underlying theme of the frailty of life, the thrust of the entire passage is the providence of God, His will for believers. His will. If it is God's will, I will do this. If it is God's will, I will do that. But I'm living in light of His presence, in light of His authority. And that means that life goes according to His plan, not ours. Whether we acknowledge it or not, it goes according to his plan, not ours. And it compels us to be accepting of that plan. And as I was, as, as I was reading through this and, and, and contemplating the passage, because sometimes it's, it's, it, we, we, we need to see the, the consequences of it how, it, how it interacts with our own lives. It is doubtful, A.W. Tozer said, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. God's will in our lives is not always pleasant on this side of eternity. There's hurt and there's heartache. There's suffering, there's trials. And I can, I can speak from experience that before the best things have happened in my life, on, on two specific occasions, I'll tell you. Not the details, but just in my life as a believer, in my life ministry. That before the very best things have happened in my life, I've gone through some tremendous loss. Tremendous hurt. Some have described that as the graduate level school of grace. We need a certain wisdom to, to go through the mountaintop experiences and remain on the right track with the Lord. We need a certain trust and faith to go through the valleys of life when it is God's will for our life and we acknowledge that and we accept it. Complete and joyful surrender to God's will is full maturity in Christ. Because what God has planned is for my ultimate good and His glory, so we trust Him through it. There's no better place to look as we prepare for the Lord's Supper than to the person of Jesus Christ. lived a life of perfect submission to the Father. To the point that he knelt on the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed with such fervor and with such passion that his sweat came out of his body as drops of blood. 
fell to the ground. The first blood that Jesus shed for me and for you was, was, was through the mortar and pestle of the grinding of God on his life to fulfill God's will for his life. He says, Lord, if it is possible, this is the Son of God, having existed from eternity past with the Father in glory, knowing the mind of the Father, knowing the will of the Father, but He prays in His humanity and He comes before Him and says, Lord, if it is possible, seeing everything that lay ahead of Him, the 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 thorns, the beatings, the, the nails, the piercings, the mocking, the jesting, the rejection. Not just of the people of Israel, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who became obedient to the point of death. Because he said, God, if it is possible, take this cup away from me. But yet, and you know the rest, not my will, but yours be done. And it's what what is so hard to see from this side of eternity. This This is part of having the wisdom and the mind of Christ in our lives. That on the other side of the challenge... On the other side of the struggle, when we place our faith, hope, and trust in Christ, and we are yielded to the will of God in our lives, on the other side of that is something better than we could have ever imagined. And that's true too. So we come to this time. Jesus completely destroyed the possibility of atheism. He came and lived and dwelt among us. He died for us. And in proof that he was exactly who he said he is, he rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave. So I want to ask you, preparing for the Lord's Supper, are you a true believer, but a practical atheist? Ponder these things in your heart. Do you believe? But if simply not yet surrendered, could this be the day? I would love to talk with you about that at some point. If you're just purely an unbeliever, I'm praying for you. But are we living lives of practical atheism? What is your life right now saying about these questions? Let the Lord search our hearts so they would partake of the Lord's Supper worthily. You spend a couple minutes, moments, contemplating these things, and I'll close this in prayer. we come before you thankful for your goodness and your grace thankful for your presence in our lives help us to be a people Lord who display that who look to you constantly rely and trust in you in Jesus name Amen if our deacons would come forward to display